Um, good afternoon. Um, welcome uh, and thank you for joining us today for the second in our Back to School News Literacy webinar series from the News Literacy Project. Um, we are going to be doing a deep dive extending some of what we talked about last week um, about misinformation. So we're going to be going into a lot more detail, um, trying to really understand what misinformation is and a bit about why it is um, obviously such a problem. Um, and we are going to also share a number of, of our resources that we have available. Um, we are very grateful for the support of the Knight Foundation. Uh, that uh, We are able to provide this webinar and many of the resources that we are sharing uh, thanks to their generous funding. And so we, are, we, we thank the Knight Foundation for helping us with this. Um, a couple of things to, uh, to note for everyone. Uh, so this is a webinar. So if you have a comment, sort of a general comment about uh, some of the content, uh, the things that we're going to be discussing, please use the chat function. Um, if you have a specific question about one of the examples or one of the concepts or that uh, Alexa and I will be talking about tonight, um, please put it in the Q&A. And so we will be addressing questions from the Q&A format. Uh, we will try to get as many to as many of those questions as we can. Also, we have enabled live transcript on this webinar. Um, so if you would like to have the uh, closed captioning transcript, um, please be sure to um, enable that in your Zoom settings. My name is John Silva. I'm part of the professional and community learning team here at the News Literacy Project. I've been here for just about five and a half years. Um, my team does professional learning for educators, but we also do this with adult audiences outside of the field of education. Um, I do a lot of work specifically with misinformation, and I also do some research and work about specifically about conspiracy theories. Before joining NLP, I was a classroom teacher. I taught social studies here in Chicago for 13 years. Um, if you'd like to reach out to me directly, my email address is there at the lower left of your screen. Um, as well as my Twitter handle. I do share a lot of things on social media about the work that we do and ways that you can include some of this um, in your classwork. And joining me for this session is Alexa Volland. Hey everyone, I'm Alexa. I just joined the News Literacy Project as the Senior Manager of Educator Professional Learning. So I'll be on John's team giving uh, teaching core news literacy concepts to educators. Um, but I'm a former journalist. Um, for the past three years, I specialized in social media, mis and disinformation, um, primarily focused on Gen Z and, and youth media consumption. Um, so I've taught media literacy and fact checking verification to uh, mostly teen audiences, but also also adult learners. And uh, like John, I was also a classroom teacher uh, teaching journalism in St. Petersburg, Florida. So we're going to start with a, with a couple of reflection questions. I want you to kind of consider these questions as it relates to how you have used your phone today. Um, you can sort of think about one particular question or try to answer more than one. Um, if you feel uh, like you would like to share it, you can drop an answer to this. But mainly I want you to think about how much and in what ways you have used your phone today. In particular, um, what have you done on social media? Have you just sort of scrolled or have you actually you know, done sort of real interaction with it? Um, have you done any news consumption today, right? So have you read any news articles, like actually read them or have you just kind of skimmed? Um, and ballpark, think about how much time you spent on your phone today. Um, you know, I use my mobile device device for a lot of obviously work-related things and it's a, kind of an outlier, but I probably spend upwards of an hour every day in various ways looking at news. Um, I haven't, I don't think I've actually, and I did put out a couple of tweets this morning. I think there's a couple of work-related tweets that I put out. Um, so I, I'm on my phone a lot, um, but I try to work on, um, keeping things, keeping work things um, out of it in the, in the afternoon. But so while you're thinking about this, I wanna share like why these questions are so important. So this is a graphic, it's been updated uh, every year for the last several years, it's called the Internet Minute. Um, the folks over at Visual Capitalist do the research in this and they put this together. This is a snapshot of sort of average traffic for um, uh, every minute of the day for these various platforms. 
Um, and there's been some interesting trends over the last couple of years. Obviously, things like Zoom have has increased significantly, obviously with the pandemic, as had, has a lot of um, e-commerce and, and sort of online shopping. But think about looking at these examples, think about how many of these can be used to communicate or share news and information in some capacity. So the thing is like there is an overwhelming amount of information that is bombarding us um, on a daily basis. But the interesting thing is, is that in all of this, actually only a, a fairly small percentage is actually news. But this informs one of the main problems that drives misinformation is that first we have information overload. There's just, there, it's just a deluge across all of our screens. But because of the ways that we engage with and the way we use social media, we often find ourselves in these echo chambers, right? You know, we, we follow people who have beliefs that are similar to ours or people who have similar um, you know, political um, affiliations, right? We, we connect mainly you know, with friends and family and such. And then you have the social media platforms with their algorithms and other things that are you know, sort of feeding additional things to us. In all of this, particularly as we become more and more passive with how we use our phones, that sort of just mindless, never-ending scroll, what's happening is that we're not really thinking or processing, we're just seeing it. And in that, we become way more vulnerable to being manipulated um, by misinformation. So we have a couple of really important learning objectives that we want to outline uh, for this session, but also for you to think about as you might want to um, do this in the classroom. Um, so obviously we did, we talked a little bit about this last week. We're going to go into much more detail here, but understanding exactly what is misinformation, um, especially the distinctions between mis and disinformation. Um, we're going to dive into some of the motivations behind misinformation. Like why do people create it? Why do people share it? And who are they? Like, who are these people that are, that we call the propagators of misinformation? And then we're going to go a little bit in, uh, or quite a bit into this the manipulation aspect, right? Misinformation manipulates us into false belief through emotional manipulation, but also tapping into um, cognitive biases. Um, so that's kind of the outline of what we're going to be doing today. And I'm going to hand off to Alexa here, who's going to kind of who's going to take over from here, um, and she's going to uh, take us through this this first major portion, Alexa. All right, thanks, John. Uh, so first, what is misinformation? It's been a big buzzword for the past several years, right? Um, so I'm gonna, be, I'm gonna be focusing on how we classify something as misinformation and, and more importantly, what makes someone compelled to believe or reshare misinformation. Um, so we actually did this exercise during our last webinar and it was really interesting to see what everyone came up with. So if you could, uh, please scan that QR code in the corner um, and uh, tell me what three words come to mind when you think or hear misinformation. If you don't have your um, phone nearby, no worries. Uh, please just drop a couple of words in the chat. So what three words would you use to define misinformation? And hopefully some of these populate in our word cloud here. Let's see what we have. Misleading, manipulated, false, dangerous. It's a good one. Propaganda. Very interesting. Inaccuracies over in the chat. Let's see, let's give this a little bit more time. Fabricated, nice. I don't know if my uh, biased propaganda lies. This menti is so cool. Misleading seems to be a really popular one. Manipulative, deceitful, pretty much all on the money. So, um, excuse me, I think I accidentally moved forward. Not having the option to, I think the mentee is like populating while I'm trying to switch slides. So just give me one sec. Okay, <laughs> so uh, when we describe misinformation, as many of you dropped in the chat, um, we define it as any false, inaccurate, misleading, or potentially incorrect information that's been shared, regardless if there is any intent to, intent to mislead there. So someone can share misinformation, 
because they're attempting to be helpful or altruistic. And John will talk about that later in this webinar. Someone might be wanting to raise awareness to something or, um, you know, just looking to chase a little bit of clout. Um, but when we talk about uh, false or misleading information, we want to really steer clear of labeling something as fake news. For one, uh, because now, as most of you probably are aware, it's become a really polarized term. Um, it's been something that's been weaponized against legitimate news agencies. Um, but for us, fake news is uh, just not a really helpful term, um, especially for students. Um, misinformation is very nuanced. And oftentimes, the best, most convincing misinformation plays on some element of truth. So it's not very helpful to just classify it as fake news. Um, so when your students are kind of instinctively calling it like, that's fake news, um, we really encourage you to challenge them to be more descriptive there. Like, what makes this fake? Are all of the people in this video that you're seeing deep fakes? Am I seeing some sort of simulation? Or was this video deceptively edited to remove context? Another thing to keep in mind is that the term fake news is no longer reserved for these kind of completely fabricated news stories like it once was. Like it is now oftentimes used as a political strategy to discredit information that doesn't support a position. Um, so while misinformation is shared regardless of the intent, on the other end, we have disinformation, which is information that is knowingly and deliberately created, created to deceive. Um, when I think of disinformation, I usually think of the intent being malicious. And it's really important to stress that depending on the context in which the information was shared, the claim could be considered misinformation or that same claim could be considered as disinformation. And I have a couple of examples of this. So it was actually Amy Adams' birthday not too long ago. And so she was trending on Twitter for her birthday. And this person shared a screenshot of an article with the headline, Amy Adams on Woody Allen, I'm going to kill that bag of bones, um, kind of a weird quote. Uh, so you might assume she's referring to Woody Allen's uh, multiple allegations of abuse for one, but there are um, a couple of obvious red flags here for me. The first being that it's a screenshot of an article and not a link. Uh, the URL listed is also a little bit suspect, um, not to mention that there's a grammatical error in the subhead. Um, and so what we did here is, uh, you know, we Googled like a pro. We just plugged in the full quote into Google and quotes are actually one of the easiest things to debunk because quotation marks are signaling to your search engine that you're looking for an exact match. Um, and so from these results, our skepticism continues. And I know that I just went on about all the reasons that we don't use the term fake news, um, but this literally came from a fake news generator website. So when we think about this in the context of misinformation versus disinformation, the person who first tweeted this out almost certainly knew it was fake, right? So given that they are knowingly sharing false information, this could to some be considered as disinformation. While the people who retweeted that tweet without actually looking into it, without reading past the headline, they would be sharing misinformation. But one thing I really want to stress is that it's very, very, very difficult to prove intent. I can't say without with absolute certainty that this person's intention was to be deceitful or malicious, unlike um, this next example, unfortunately. So this was a screenshot of a Reddit post um, that went kind of insanely viral, a bunch of different um, platforms. And it was um, shared by someone um, claiming to be the parent of a trans child. And it, it's claiming that they are forcing their child to transition. It's saying that they're um, forcing them to take hormones, that they're giving them medicine and their cereal against their will. And this, for obvious reasons, sparked a lot of outrage, right? People were really upset when this went viral. Um, and that emotional response could also be a sign that this is potential misinformation. Um, but when we take a pause and we plug in some of those keywords from the claim, um, one, we get a bunch of fact checks um, that point to this being completely fabricated. And um, so what happened was, 
journalists do what they do best. And they started with the foundational question of who. Um, this was posted by a user called Funky Duffy. Like, so who is Funky Duffy? Who is this parent? Who posted this? Um, and the thing about disinformers is that oftentimes they use the same exact handle or screen name for all of their accounts. Um, and so journalists were able to trace this claim back to an online forum, which revealed that um, essentially online trolls uh, collectively organized and planned to flood a parents of trans kids subreddit group with false negative stories of abuse. And so the people who were sharing the screenshot out of shock, out of fear, anger, worried for the potential abuse or the safety of this child, they would be sharing misinformation. However, the fact that we can definitively prove that this was an organized strategic effort to platform hateful stereotypes um, about trans youth, about the parents of trans youth, makes this disinformation because there is a very, very, very clear documented intent to do harm here. And I think this is a really prime example of that misinformation truly relies on emotional manipulation. It's literally what it's designed to do. Um, and if we didn't feel anything when we saw something, there's no real motivator to reshare it, right? But when our emotions take over, um, we have that knee-jerk reaction to share because it, quote, feels true. Um, and this is especially the case for teenagers as well as older adults. And so this is what we would call emotional reasoning. When we let our emotions lead us to the conclusions, as opposed to critical thinking, when we take a pause and come to conclusions based on fact and information and after taking the time to evaluate credible evidence. So let's go back to the Amy Adams example I showed you earlier. And again, using that mentee, what emotional reactions do you think people had when seeing this? And again, if you don't have your phone nearby, please feel free to just drop those in the chat. But seeing this headline, Amy Adams, oops, sorry, I moved the chat and it got angry at me. Um, but what emotional reactions do you think people might have after seeing this? Anger, anger and shock is a big one. Hurt. Okay, here we go. Distrust, trauma, disappointment could be disappointment in Amy Adams' reaction or in the quote or in um, Woody Allen. Disgust is a really popular one. Okay, proud, different. Proud of Amy Adams maybe standing up for herself or taking a stand against um, you know, abuse in that industry. These are all really interesting ones. See if we can keep going. Scary, weird, unbelievable. Unbelievable being a really key one here. Um, okay, here the mentee goes. Awesome. Suspicion. Suspicion came up a couple of times. Interesting. Oops. Sorry. Oops, we went, we jumped way ahead. Okay, so as you saw, one story can elicit a bunch of different emotions. I saw disgust, fear, and then also proud. Um, and it's really important when we're talking about different, um, with this with students, that we stress that any emotion can be used to manipulate you. Those really feel good, cute stories about puppies um, that make you feel happy can also be misinformation, right? And um, when you're talking about emotional reasoning with students, one thing that I always note is that feelings of anger, shock, disgust, that word came up a lot. Um, those are definitely signs that something could be missing important context. But when we feel those types of emotions, disgust, outrage, especially when we're seeing political posts that use language like the left or the right, Another thing that's happening in the background is feelings of validation. And when we feel validated, um, we're feeling validated because that's not the team I root for, right? Um, but when we feel validated, all fact checking typically goes out the window and, and we completely forget to fact check the things that make us um, feel right. And which brings us to a couple of key terms. 
So the first being confirmation bias, which is a completely natural tendency. We accept the information that reinforces our own beliefs. This aligns with my views and morals, therefore it has to be true. And motivated reasoning, and this is when we deliberately interpret information so that it confirms our beliefs. And when we find ways to dismiss anything that dis and we find ways to dismiss anything that disproves those beliefs, right? That's when our brain does the mental gymnastics so that we're right. Um, and this is really common when we see um, really uh, beautiful infographics online um, because data can be one of those things that can be interpreted multiple ways to tell a particular so, uh, story or to sell our particular narrative. Um, but very quickly, we have a very amazing new infographic um, that breaks down confirmation bias versus motivated reasoning. And we will make sure that we drop this new resource in the chat. And we touched on this a little bit earlier when I was talking about validation, but it's really worth repeating um, that your political and social beliefs most certainly affect your emotional response. So here's another example. This tweet is an example of imposter content. So Chicago PD never tweeted out that we are all Derek Chauvin following his conviction. That's not true. Um, but depending on your views of law enforcement, of Chicago, Chicago PD in particular, or for, you know, your views on the George Floyd case, um, that would dictate how you would respond emotionally. For those with negative views of law enforcement, um, this could fuel those existing beliefs and they could deepen them. For those who have really positive views of law enforcement, they could see this and it could reaffirm negative feelings of those who are critical of law enforcement. So it's really important that when we talk about the emotional side, we also include that your personal beliefs um, are also dictating that. So do we have any questions so far before I turn it back over to John? Sorry that my mentee kind of made us skip ahead, but... Yeah, we'll just pause here for a second to see if you know if people have any questions. Please feel free to drop them in the Q and A section. Um, and please make sure you're watching the chat. Liz is our colleague. Liz is behind the scenes, um, dropping links to some of these resources. So we'll just pause one more second to see if there are any questions. Otherwise, I will move into the next section. All right, back to you, John. Thank you. Um, okay, so um, <clears throat> oh, so here, there is one Q and there is one question that just popped in. When do you have students distinguish between misinformation and disinformation? You know, I think honestly that is one of the most important things that you have to do right off the bat if you're going to start teaching about misinformation. Obviously, because uh, definitions matter. Um, and, you know, it's an, it's, it's an unfortunate um, happenstance that I think a lot of adults tend to conflate these terms. I think we do see people use the, use the words interchangeably, but disinformation not only has a very important um, definition, but it's also that disinformation comes from kind of more specific types of sources. You know, we traditionally associate disinformation with state sources, right? So if we talk about the, the ongoing war in Ukraine, right? We know that there's a lot of disinformation that is coming out of uh, the, the Russian government in one form or another, either you know directly from the government or through state controlled media and, and other sorts of sources like that, right? Um, so disinformation also has sort of a very important political component to it frequently. Misinformation has a much, a much broader sense to it and quite honestly, I think most of us, especially most young people, when we encounter you know, false information, it would be considered misinformation. So it's really just about understanding the definition. I would do that kind of um, off the bat. Um, and yes, uh, somebody posted if we can if we can uh, repost the links, we will go ahead and, and we'll 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 continue to share the links. But also, we will send a follow-up email after today's webinar where we will share those links again. So let's talk about um, why this part of why this happens, why why this why this is an ongoing concern. 
Um, and one important thing is like, this isn't unique to any particular social media platform. You know, misinformation can come from anywhere. But it's important to talk about this from the perspective of motivations as opposed to kind of thinking about intent. I know it sounds like it could be the same thing, but the problem is that we can't always determine intent with any degree of accuracy. Sometimes we can, there are sometimes, sometimes we can we can see that there is a clear intent, but it's, in, it's important that we can't always know for certain, but also when we see a piece of misinformation, the intent can be different for different people who share it. You know, some people might share something because they genuinely think it's true um, and they and they feel compelled to. Some people can share things um, knowing it's false, but then they might be trying to get a laugh. But talking about these motivations helps us understand how and why misinformation spreads and helps us understand it at a, at a much deeper level. But also, the, the better we understand all of this, the less susceptible we are um, to being manipulated. So... In our Checkology lesson on misinformation, um, we describe what we call these five main motivations. So when we look at false information, usually one or more of these is involved. A lot of times there is a financial component to it. When we see what we used to call you know, fake news sites, we see these sort of clickbaity things, there is a financial component, either through um, advertising, like clicking on, clicking on a link, will generate ad revenue because the ads pop up or it could be you know ways that um, accounts are monetized some people spread it as a way of being influential like they want to be an influencer in certain spaces or they want to be able to get a large number of followers some people do it just because they can they want to see what kind of reaction they get from people but where we see things probably most problematic are when misinformation is used to deepen um, the divisions that we have, right? Um, our divided political beliefs, our divided social beliefs, um, and misinformation can be used to, to sort of deepen those wedges and kind of exploit those divisions in ways that are re really problematic. And then also there is a sense of just of, of trying to erode trust in some sort of institution. We have seen a great deal of this in things related to um, health and medicine and wellness. You know, we have major problems with um, you know diseases. Because, you know, polio is is threatening to make a comeback in, uh, in in New York, partly because people don't trust vaccines. Um, and we've seen you know how many hundreds of thousands of people probably died needlessly of COVID nineteen because because they didn't trust um, the science, they didn't trust the vaccines, but also we see it in our politics. You know, there is a lot of misinformation about our elections integrity. Um, and when people are propagating misinformation and, and even conspiracy theories about our elections and election integrity, you know, that erodes people's trust in our elections. And that, and that's created a whole other sort of batch of problems, right? Um, so these are these are what we categorize as kind of the main motivations. And so when we look at misinformation, um, we can sort of figure out like what's behind it, like what's driving a particular piece. And then where does it come from and who shares it? So we have what we call these four types of propagators. So when we look at who is creating it, who is sharing it, like who's making it go, go viral, this gets to also a little bit about behind those motivations. Some people are doing it because they are looking out for themselves. Um, often, this this is there's a this is a lot with the financial component, but so people are looking out for themselves in some way. But or they're using misinformation as a way of promoting um, a group, either a political group or people who share a, a social or cultural belief. Right? There's a group interest in using misinformation to further some sort of um, either belief or position. Sometimes, though. Um, just regular people unknowingly share something that is false because they genuinely believe that it's true. And out of this sense of alt altruism, they are sharing it because they feel like other people should, should see it and know it. Um, and then the last one is the sort of most extreme part of this, like the, the malicious propagators. This is where we see the trolls, right? The people who create this malicious content um, because they are trying to cause problems, because they are trying to drive wedges, because they're trying to see what kind of a reaction they can get. 
but we also see it on the very sort of fringes of different groups and also in particular with people who propagate um, some you know very dark conspiracy theories so i'm going to show you some examples of these obviously they're not always they don't always fall into one particular category um but this account in particular so dr joseph Merkula, he is number one uh, of the what's called the disinformation dozen from the center for countering digital hate he spreads a great deal of medical misinformation across a wide variety of topics. And why is he doing this? Well, he is trying in particular to promote his natural health practice. He is trying to drive people to his, uh, to his business. And he's trying to get people to know, you know, to not trust traditional medicine because he has these sort of natural healing uh, practices. That's not to say that there's a problem with natural healers, like natural health. There's a, there's a lot of things that, that, that are good in, in sort of that field. The problem is when you're using misinformation and even sometimes disinformation um, as a way of trying to, to drum up business for yourself. And he is, he is a prolific um, propagator of medical misinformation, as you can see from these two examples. What's interesting is that you don't see this on his Twitter account or on his Instagram account. Um, you see this actually in some of the, some other platforms. So these two examples in particular are from Gab, right? So he shares this in places where there's not so much control over false information. So he's actually very careful about where he shares things like these. Um, but we also have things like this amazing physics Twitter account. Um, which is an example of what we call engagement bait. So I cut out the audio. This is a, a screen grab from a TikTok account. So this guy's, he creates these videos, these fun videos with his kids, right? And if you look at it, it's obvious. It is obvious that this little tea candle is not making a mask float up, right? It's that That's just not how that works. But this account shares videos like this as if they are authentic, right? And so what are they doing? Um, so there's there's a couple important things. One, the engagement bait aspect of this is that they are trying to build up followers and they are trying to get engagement through likes and comments and retweets. And as that happens, they have the ability to monetize the account in some way. Um, so whoever runs this Twitter account, right, they are trying, they're using false information um, with these motivations. Um, this example is from last year um, in August as the United States was withdrawing from Afghanistan. Um, so this image went ma massively viral, claiming that the military had abandoned um, their working dogs at, in Afghanistan. So as, as the American military was leaving, um, they had abandoned these dogs. It is actually, it's completely not true. It's an authentic image. This is what we call false context misinformation. But that's actually an image of animals from a local small animal rescue operation. These are not military working dogs. Um, but they, so not only did this political group share this, but also PETA got involved and they shared this. We, we can't know for sure when they posted this, if they knew it wasn't true, or if like a lot of us, they had been manipulated emotionally into sharing this. But, you know, these this example fed their particular group interest, right? On the one hand, we've got a, a political group that is using it because of their political viewpoints. And then we have PETA who's using it because of their, their social cause. Uh, so we have political cause, social cause, but also there's a financial component. Both of them use this in some way um, as kind of a fundraising tool. Um, but they, you know, both of them eventually um, pulled them down but this is this is where something can go viral and then we really want to get at like sort of what's behind it um these are kind of an, these are kind of older examples um but so back at sort of at the height of the pandemic there were all these uh alternative uh treatments where people were pushing these these false um alternatives to being vaccinated and one in particular was ivermectin um uh the horse medicate you know livestock medication um, but people were creating, these are screenshots of TikTok. So people were creating these and sharing this information about how to sort of safely use ivermectin, promoting this idea that it is a safe, but it's not alternative to vaccines. 
right? But so these people had genuinely been manipulated into this belief by others and they created this content because they wanted to share it with others, right? Um, now, there's not necessarily going to be a financial component to this, but like others, they're trying to promote this to get people to not trust the vaccines, but also they're trying to influence people. So they're trying to get followers, they're trying to join this, this movement. So the, it seems weird to think of it this way, but there is often a, a, a sense of altruism behind this information. Um, and then the last one is when we talk about malicious propagators. Um, so these are some screen grabs from um, a particular website that is known to, to post uh, fake, what they call health news articles. Um, and obviously you can see, you know, just how dark some of these get. You know, we have one that's, that's you know, using sort of religious imagery with like, you know, talking about, you know, a demon portal and Lucifer and, um, and promoting the, the thoroughly debunked, but it still continues uh, links between um, vaccines and autism, which still continues to be a major problem in a lot of communities, right? So sites such as this, sources such as this, right? They are putting out this false information because they are trying to have the, the greatest shock value. They are trying to use the sort of darkest emotions and, and deep emotions um, but there is also a, a major financial incentive. Sites like this one often have a lot of ads embedded. So every time you go to their site, every time you click on one of their articles, right, it's generating ad revenue. So, uh, you know, the, the more shocking their articles can be, the more people are going to click on it. And so that's also something we need to be aware of. You know, the more we click on these articles, the, we're kind of helping support their operation. Um, so to kind of sum up, when we talk about, when we try to talk about intent and we talk about motivation, it helps us categorize um, misinformation. So this is the example we talked about last week with uh, Mr. Rogers and Steve Irwin, right? You, trying to understand how and why people share this helps us sort of classify it. You know, some people might see it and retweet it because they think it's authentic and they have that kind of, you know, a sort of a positive emotional reaction to it. And they, they retweet it and they move on. Um, some people might share it because, you know, they know it's not true, but they want to get those likes. Like, you know, there is a, there's a dopamine hit that we get when people like our content. The more people engage with it, the more that helps sort of the, the, the feel good stuff that happens in our brain. Um, but sometimes people are doing it um, because um, they are trying to, they're, they're trying to, to manipulate this into thinking that it's real. Um, so talking about these things really helps us um, understand. So um, I want to share what we call some basic red flags. Um, so these are some things that we can kind of outline with young people, but also things for us to consider um, some common things that, that should be warning signs. Um, one is what we call institutional cynicism. Um, as as th those of you who are educators, especially those of you who have been middle school teachers, you know that there, there is just, there's a lot of cynicism built in with adolescents in general, but a lot of adults struggle with this, right? If you just sort of believe that, that these groups are kind of always out to get us, right? When you lump people together, that they're all, they're out to get us, they are doing things that are dishonest or, or even illegal or unethical, and they're all in on it, right? That's institutional cynicism. You know, a classic example, we you know, people talk about big pharma, like all pharmaceutical companies are part of some great big effort to to deceive us, to manipulate us, to to line their pockets, um, you know, people talk about the media, um, and, and you know, another very common one was also you know the government, as if you know the government. You think about how massive, the, especially like the federal government is. The idea that you know all of these people working in the government could be behind these sorts of things. So, watching out for the sort of cynical belief is a really important red flag. So people are making a claim and, and they're using these sort of cynical phrasing, something to watch out for. When we talk about cognitive biases, so misinformation manipulates us emotionally, but it also can manipulate us through these cognitive biases. And one of them is proportionality bias. Um, it's the idea that uh, if something big happens, there has to be some big cause behind it, right? Um, so here's an example. 
Um, this is actually at the heart of a lot of 9-11 uh, conspiracy theories, right? So this idea, so they're trying to compare these two things. Um, and if you are sort of engaging in proportionality bias, you know, it might make per perfect sense, but this is trying to manipulate you into false belief by tapping into that particular bias. If we can recognize that and we can take a step back, Right, we might be able to recognize pretty quickly. Okay, that just doesn't make logic. You know, there's no logic sense behind this. You know, it just doesn't 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 stand up. Um, this is this is a similar kind of bias. We call this intentionality bias. But basically, intentionality bias is there's no such thing as an accident. Everything happens for a reason. There has to be some intentional act behind it. Um, and this is actually something that's been happening um, recently. Um, and one of the phrases that's very common with this is there are no coincidences. If you see there are no coincidences, that's a major red flag phrase right there. But this has actually popped up. It pops up every so often, but there's these, these sort of dark beliefs that somehow these notable celebrities um, who, who passed unexpectedly, right? So we have um, Paul Walker and, and Heish who died tragically in, in traffic accidents. Um, Anthony Bourdain, who I believe um, died by overdose, right? People ascribe these, and there must be some nefarious intent behind it. There has to be some reason why they died and they did. And then people try to drive that to pushing towards this these false beliefs, right? So there's one that, um, this idea that somehow they were going to expose Hollywood. Um, and then people are looking at sort of the meanings behind numbers and, and such, right? So and if, if you see like there are no coincidences, major red flag phrase. Um, but there are some others um, that are very common, right? So when you see things like this, um, you want to be very wary. I mean, I think a lot of you have, have seen and talked about, you know, do your own research. Um, uh, that's, that's one that's gotten a lot of things. But there are some language that happens with this where you have to be wary. So like when you see like the media won't report, report this, right? That's institutional cynicism fueled, right? And chances are, if it's if it's something that's happening, right? Well, if if you know about it, but the media is not reporting about it, how do you know, right? But just applying some basic questioning and logic to some of these things, um, it, they fall apart pretty quickly. Even if you don't take some time to verify it, uh, make this go viral and let that sink in. These are two that actually really are kind of tapping into the anxiety that we feel if we feel like we're on the outside. Like if, if there's something that people know, but we don't, you know, we don't like that feeling, you know, we don't like that discomfort that there might be something that we should know, but we don't. Um, and that can lead to towards what we, you know, it's called cognitive dissonance. You know, we want to, we, we don't like that. We want that feeling to go away. So we might actually engage in some emotional reasoning and sort of make it make sense in ways that it doesn't. Um, so it's really important to remember with these misinformation red flags that at the heart of all of this, just so much of this and, and you know, confirmation bias and motivated reasoning um, are the main drivers of misinformation. And it's what makes misinformation go viral, um, you know, because, you know, with confirmation bias, it taps into our existing beliefs. It, it taps into those emotions. Right, and by it taps into, it makes us engage in emotional reasoning. So we really wanna outline this and, and really kind of give students an opportunity to do some sort of metacognition. Like how do I process information? Like how do I react to things? And how can I sort of train myself to pause before I engage with something or, or even share something? So I'm gonna pause here um, to see if there are um, some additional questions. Um, yes, we will be emailing the links. Um, we, so we will comp compile all the links um, and we will send them um, at the end of today's, either today or tomorrow morning, we're, we're gonna send an email to everyone who registered so you'll have all the links. Um, we will also provide a link to the recording of this webinar. Um, and we will also be providing a PDF of the slides that Alexa and I used um, in in this session. Um, okay, so we have a, so in the Q and A, I worry about cases where these instances of cynical bias were justified. Um, things like New York Times reporting on the Iraq War or CDC's confusion around masks. So 
there is an interesting point there that that yes, there are some things that people used to be cynical about um, and we kind of dismissed it and then it turned out to be true. Um, yeah, so there are some things that we once classified as, as, as in the realm of conspiracy theories and they turned out to be true. That's not evidence that something else could be true, right? Um, what we have to recognize though is that cynicism on its face um, is, is, it's not what we wanna do. So what I would actually say to that is that the people who um, had, you know, the people who were criticizing, let's, let's say the, the, the reporting on the Iraq war and sort of the justification, the people who were pushing that and the, who, and, and people were criticizing, hey, no, that's not true. You shouldn't do that. Those folks were not necessarily engaging in cynicism. They were engaging more in skepticism. Um, it's the cynic who just dismisses everything out of hand. Um, it's the cynic who just accepts things that, you know, a certain way. Um, the people who are skeptical are the ones who question in a way that is productive and, and rational. Um, so it's, it, that's, that's the thing is like, you know, the cynic would just accept things at face value and just, and just dismiss things out of hand. Uh, it's kind of a tricky way to describing it, right? Um, but so that's the thing is we do, we want to be encouraging healthy skepticism with young people, right? Don't don't let your cynicism dismiss information, but likewise don't let your cynicism accept things because it confirms your cynicism. Um, where do we find our examples? Um, so we spend a lot of time on social media. Um, so Alexa and I and a number of other, of our colleagues we spend time kind of every day. Um, sometimes we search for specific examples, but we watch the things that are going viral. We see what the fact checkers are talking about. Um, we track different types of channels. Um, you know, we are, you know, we're all on Twitter and Instagram and we see things on Facebook, but also we're on some of the alternative platforms. You know, we, we track things that are happening on Gab and on Telegram channels and on Rumble. Um, sometimes we see things like on discord servers. So this is part of what we do is like, we are, we're sort of watching the, the, the misinformation that's going viral. And then we kind of go, we go look for those examples and we take screenshots. Um, how do I respond to someone who's spreading misinformation? That's a great question. Um, so one of the first things, if someone posts something on social media that you know is not true, you have to resist the urge of kind of mocking them or criticizing them, right? You wanna avoid the urge of being sort of negative. You, you wanna sort of start with the idea that maybe they don't realize that it's not true, unless it's obvious. Um, but usually the way I like to suggest this is like, when somebody posts something that's not true, find information that shows that it, that it is not true, something that debunks it and share it in a way that invites them to evaluate it for themselves. So don't just paste the link, it's like, like that, it's not true, here's, here's why. You know, maybe you share it in a way that sort of invites a conversation. You know, so you find the link, it's like, you know what? I, think, I, I don't think that that's accurate and I saw this, so take a look and tell me what you think, right? You, you always wanna try to approach this from the, from the perspective that, it can be a conversation starter. You know, you, you don't want the person to feel stupid. You don't want to belittle them. You want them to kind of reach the conclusion themselves by kind of showing them the evidence. Um, at what point did we become so gullible? Um, we've always been gullible. <laughs> um, it's, we've always been, it always has been easy to manipulate us. Um, you know, I went to Rome a couple of years ago and I remember taking a tour of the Colosseum and the guide told us a story about how um, ancient Romans believed that the great fire of Rome was deliberately started by Emperor Nero, specifically to make room for a palace and eventually the Colosseum. So con conspiracy theories and false information has been around for a very, very long time. Um, it does not, it, the internet, social media is just a new communication channel, you know, and misinformation comes from lots of sources. My son got introduced to conspiracy theories when he was in second grade. We were walking to school and he saw that someone had stenciled on the sidewalk, um, uh, flat earth Chicago. Um, 
I've seen people, I've seen bumper stickers, I've seen signs, you know, people spread things in lots of different ways. Um, and, you know, people started believing the moon landing was faked and, you know, not long after the actual moon landing. So it's not, it's not the internet. It's the internet is just one particular, um, it's just one particular communication channel. Um, how do I approach political topics without tipping my view? Um, you know, we are, as, a, as an, uh, an education nonprofit organization, we are rigidly nonpartisan. And so part of this is recognizing that a lot of misinformation is overtly political, but it's not always. And so what we focus on, there's two key things that we focus on when we do our work. One is that we focus on what is factual, what can be verified, right? So we can verify that it, an image has been photoshopped, for example, right? We can verify that somebody has taken a video out of context, but we can also emphasize that we, we want to get information from credible, reliable sources, and that can come from a lot of different places. So it's, it's just one of those things that our emphasis is not on the politics themselves, it's about the perspectives. It's about what, you know, what are people using in support of their views. Um, so it's, it is, a, it is, it's tricky sometimes, but it's, that's how we approach this. And I think that's a really important way that you can approach this with your students, right? Is that we're not talking about the, the politics themselves. We're not talking about the, the particular political viewpoints um, about that. What we're doing with news literacy is focusing on where can we get the most credible, reliable, verified information? Where can we get the viewpoints that are based on logic and evidence and reasoning, as opposed to viewpoints that are based on falsehoods and maybe even propaganda? So that's the thing is like, we can talk about these topics in a way that emphasizes what can we verify for ourselves and what can we support? Like we have positions, what can, how can we support our positions in a way that's factual um, and, and somewhat logical? Um, what would you call all bat boy and Elvis sightings? Yeah, um, that's a great point. I mean, weekly world news has been at the checkout counter of grocery stores for a very, very long time, you know, but, you know, I don't know that I would, you know, I don't know that I would necessarily call those like completely fake news. You know, some of those are really, we would sort of more call those like entertainment, that, you know, entertainment things, but so. Um, okay, so let's talk about some uh, classroom resources. So here are, the, I'm going to show you some things that we have in particular that you can use um, to approach misinformation in particular um, with your students. One that, you know, the, the starting point for a lot of this is the Checkology Virtual Classroom. Um, you know, misinformation, we have a lesson specifically about misinformation. It focuses on the five types and some of the motivations. So things we talked about last week, but also today. We have two brand new lessons that we just launched this year that also fall into this, this category. Um, they are awesome. One is about being health informed. So if we think about health and wellness uh, so on social media, the, the, the claims that people are making that, that are supposed to make us healthier, right? There's a lot of junk um, claims out there that can actually be very dangerous to us. Um, and they are using falsehoods to sort of spread these things, but also science-based claims. They're, we have been talking about things science-related in ways that we hadn't for a very long time and understanding some of the science that's happening out there right now, especially when we talk about like vaccines and viruses and, and variants and, and vectors and public health issues and so many things. Um, and how you know news organizations report on science. So evaluating science-based claims is also a brand new lesson. Um, so our our team over on the one of our teams, they, uh, Peter Adams and his team, they've done an amazing job with this. Um, going back to the five types, if you go to our website at newslit.org and you click on for educators, one of our infographics is a classroom poster that you can print out, which uh, has these examples of the five types of misinformation. Um, these are the ones that we covered last week. So if you didn't, you weren't able to attend that, um, we'll, we'll make sure to include a link to that uh, the recording to that session so you can see that. But so we have this. Um, we also have a one pager infographic um, that kind of also talks about the five types. It covers the differences between mis and disinformation, shares some of the things with those red flags. 
um, also talks a bit about the motivations. So this is a great one page infographic that you can use. There's also some links to some additional resources that you can take a look um, that are, that's there on the lower right. So you can download this infographic as well. We talked about this last week, the Google Like a Pro, um, you know, learning how to do effective targeted internet searching. Alexa touched on it in her section earlier. We talked a lot about it last week, right? Just learning how to do effective targeting internet searches. This is going to be your most powerful tool um, in verifying information and knowing when you, something you see may not be accurate. Um, okay, so next week we have a very special webinar as part of our series. So on August 31st, this one will be at three o'clock Eastern time. Um, that is partly because the young people who are leading the session, uh, they are the co-directors of Teens for Press Freedom. We've worked with them in the past. So we have a student-led session that Alexa will be moderating where they are going to be talking about um, misinformation and journalism and news literacy from their perspective. These are some amazing young people. Um, so we kind of had to adjust the, the time to be able to handle their school schedules. So we're very excited for this session. I hope you'll be able to join us. So again, that's three o'clock Eastern time. So session three is on August 31st. Um, and we will include more information about this also in the follow-up email. So um, I'm going to pause here for our final questions. Um, if you would please take a few minutes, this QR code and the link there on your screen is to our feedback survey. Um, your feedback is absolutely vital to the work that we do. We want to make sure that we are providing relevant information as well as things that you can easily take back to your classroom, uh, take back to your schools um, for, for being able to do this in the classroom, to be able to teach this to young people. So we have this, this feedback survey. So I'm gonna to go to um, the chat and the Q and A. So if you have any further questions, um, please feel free to drop it either in the Q and A in the chat. We have, we have just about, we have, we have about three minutes left in the hour. So um, Janet, thank you for joining us. We're very glad, Rebecca also, John, Stephanie, we're, we're very glad that you can join us today. Um, Alexa and I will stay on for a couple more minutes as we kind of wrap up. Um, so if you have any follow-up questions, um, please feel free um, to uh, drop it here, or you can, I'm going to drop my email in the chat. I'm going to ask Alexa if she, if she would um, also drop hers in the chat. So if you want to reach out to us directly um, after today, um, you, can, you can email us directly. Um, Anna Marie, thank you. Shirley, thank you so much. We're very glad you can join us. Um, I'm hope, I, we are hoping that you found this to be an effective use of your time today. And this is the last thing that I want to say. I want. I, I hope everyone has um, an amazing school year. I know a new school year is always an exciting time, but we also recognize that this is an incredibly challenging time for a lot of classroom teachers in a lot of parts of the country. But Please just remember that the News Literacy Project and our teams are here to support you for how you would like to do this. Um, so we are here to support you. So we, we are very grateful for the work that you're doing. We're very excited that you are interested in doing news literacy with your students. Um, and yes, Judith, we will be sending the links to the recordings out. Um, uh, we'll send the recordings out in an email to everyone who registers after each session. And then when we wrap up all six of our sessions in September, we will send a, a final email out uh, to everyone. Um, we will also see if we can download the chat, chat transcript. Um, so thank you very much for joining us. Um, I hope you have uh, a really, uh, just a good rest of your day. And I hope you're, if you have started, I hope your school years are off to a good start. Um, if you're about to start, good luck. Um, I, you know, it's been almost six, it's been six years since my last first day of school and I, I still miss it a little bit from time to time. Um, so, um, thank you very much for your time today. Um, and we will see you next week with the Teens for Press Freedom.